Brenda, John, come on back up. Uh, before we break for lunch, let's uh, light up the panel with a few questions. You can go any direction if you stop and take in everything that they were uh, discussing overall. And, and again, remember the microphones are placed in the room. No dairy on beef, Peapod? Give me a little bright spot. Otherwise, they're going to get ready to hang themselves. Milk production report for <laughs> December comes out today. And you think that's, that could be a leading indicator of what is going to happen first quarter? Very possibly. We'll have to see what the numbers are in terms of production. and He does dairy, too. And beef. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that we've talked about that before on could be a telltale sign, not just here, but globally. Very yeah. much so. What, you don't want to step on Chucky? Globally, <laughs> what do you yeah. think? No, I think so. I think what so. do you think? Forecast for me. Are we going to see milk production go up, flatline, down? It comes out this afternoon. Ooh. <laughs> down. You're just playing to the crowd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think, John? I would agree I would, with the cow numbers coming down. I mean, throw in weather. Dairy on beef, Brenda? How much of an impact that's going to be on not only price but a consumption? Because I know you're talking largely native beef, but dairy on beef is what's been lighting up Wisconsin. Yeah, dairy, dairy on beef is is a is a big is a big impact, particularly in Wisconsin. Um, from a national perspective, it's something we talk about, but in still in relative terms, you know, that's going to be a small percentage compared to native beef for example, um, of, as, as far as our beef supply. But it is a big impact for Wisconsin, um, just the way in which it's working. One thing that's really nice is that um, now within the last year, USDA has kind of started uh, putting in some of their, in their contracts. So you can actually go out and to start to track some of the, on a national level, some of the basis differences. Um, before it, it, we really couldn't do that. We had the choice of dairy or we had beef. Now they have that dairy on beef in those reports. So for the last year, we've been able to look at a little bit of those differences in prices and see where that's happening. What's I'm happening curious, I, I was, this question comes from seeing some of your poultry numbers and John talking about pork and that before. How much of that industry is still held in private hands? Poultry, pork. Uh, at least, I'm, I mean, both sides of them, and the vertical integration, just the corporate purchases of to really minimize, and especially in the pork industry, the private producer. I know we deal with very few that are not contract raised or some form. Uh, again, I think, unfortunately, the beef industry, because of some other demographics, could be headed that way as well. Uh, when you looked at your cattle numbers, talking to the cattle people I see out there, too, the age factor is becoming a big part of this. We're not seeing cow numbers because, you know, I'm talking to some of the older producers. They just don't want to fight it anymore, and they're going to go to the contract raise or the vertically integrated type operation. So that could be a factor we see going forward there as well. Brenda, what about poultry? I'm going to be honest on that one. I can't answer that. I'm um, just guessing. One thing Not where much. I would say, I'm going to add with John, where I think you see a lot more of those contractors um, in that, particularly in Wisconsin, is that dairy on beef. Is that, I think that's a more, that, that chain there is much more... Um, defined and you have to have that more integration when you're mm -hmm. looking at that dairy on beef than you do necessarily when you're looking at native beef, particularly in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that integration there, again, from a Wisconsin perspective is going to, is going to, we're going to see that greater than we probably do elsewhere on a beef side. Consensus on these federal milk orders, Chuck. I mean, what are we, this is the 11th week now, which we didn't necessarily see coming. And now you're telling me maybe we'll hear something by the end of the calendar year? But so where's I have, mud right now? I have good news. Uh, Dana Cole, the administrator of dairy programs, says we are done on the 2nd of February. Really? Yeah. So the likely trajectory from here is they will finish the hearing, and then there's a very set calendar that has to take place of different steps define 30, 60, 90 days going forward, I imagine that we might have a recommended decision uh, by uh, middle, late summer, if all goes according to plan, then the follow on commentary and final decision even by the end of the year. I'm not thinking that this will have a major impact uh, if they do get that far in the process on the milk prices for 2024. Uh, but certainly as we think about the future 2025, that's where we 
are, are going to be in a zone where those changes will take place. I guess the other thing is, is that we don't know yet what USDA is going to do, uh, but I do think that they're likely to make some adjustments to those make allowances that would have an impact on the, on the class three price. And I do think they're likely to do something on the class one differentials, which has a somewhat offsetting effect on a national level, but not as helpful for Wisconsin with 6% class one utilization. If nobody else is going to save you with the question, Little Mouse told me USDA will randomly select a date when they will conduct the vote on whatever recommendations they come up with. If you didn't pool milk on that date, you don't get to vote. Minnesota uh -huh. milk, Lucas. I, I have not heard See, that. Me either. That's why I'm hoping. So I, can, I can't confirm or deny that USDA plans to do that. But I guess I, I have uh, I have faith in the folks at USDA that they have a very good faith idea about the process, uh, and they are trying to hold up the scales of justice and be fair to both dairy producers uh, and to dairy processors in this in this whole effort. But I will say. Uh, that the hearing process has been extraordinarily painful for nearly everyone, with the possible exception of the administrative law judge yes. who <laughs> seems to have fun doing this. I, I wait for the before and after picture. Before they look like they're 16, after they look like me. You know, after 11 weeks worth of federal milk, more, yeah. yeah. Anything else? I mean, um, otherwise, oh, there you go, Paul. Question for John. This is. The ARC and PLC signups are going on now, and this is the USDA's barking year average farm price. Um, and and they, they're going to project a new one here in mid February, when they typically have. Um, and they're, the floor for corn at the PLC price floor is 401, and that's that season average, marking year average price for you know, all farm. For soybeans, it's 926. Do you, I, your numbers are somewhat pessimistic on corn, where that 401, uh, what's your thoughts there? What, how close to that 401 floor is the marking your average price for farmers going to get at the national level? Unfortunately, to be bold, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of in agreement. Um, I'm very, very concerned for the corn market this year if we don't see the demand kick back in. Uh, we're going to see a forecast of production here for the March you know, acres number. First line trend line yield probably coming out the February outlook meeting will be like 182, 181. You know, we start putting those numbers in. If we put over 90 million acres out there, we're going to have a, a, a monster pile, and we could very well be looking at three billion bushel carryover come next fall. Okay, that's going to put us back to the fourteen fifteen price window, uh, at least according to those numbers and stocks to use. The big factor that's going to need to come into that obviously will be the demand. Now, the USDA will reflect demand on the, the balance sheets as we get lower prices. That just incurs extra demand. Uh, but watch the South American weather. I didn't really talk about Argentina much. They're looking at a possibly 60 million metric ton corn crop after two years of consecutive drought. That'll be a record production. That's a country in need of finances. They are going to put that on the market and at a very, very low price that we won't be able to compete with. So I'm pretty defensive of the corn market right now. I've been telling producers, you know, hey, we got 475 out there for next fall. Make sure we're getting the floors in here. Mm. Fellow farm broadcaster Larry Lee from the Brownfield Network. Good to see you, buddy. What do you got? I'm going to follow up on your question, Pam. Uh, I believe it was Brenda's slide, but the questions for all three of you. You mentioned that beef production is actually up in Wisconsin, but not so much everywhere else. Do we have a way to track how much of that increase is beef on dairy? Okay, first off, beef production isn't up. Beef cows are up. Um, we actually have less on cattle on feed right now, um, but but we're bucking the trend as far as for not um, declining the beef herd per se is what the what the U.S. is. Do we have a way of tracking what percentage of beef that is produced is beef on dairy relative to beef? Um, I did some work on that like five years ago when we were able to be able to track numbers a little bit more. It's the, the challenge, it, it becomes a lot more challenging to do that with, um, because the way that when they, those animals are um, uh, marketed and the way the USD reports it, they have a choice between reporting it as beef, as dairy, and now, as I said, now they have this mix, but that's only been in the last year. So as that grew, we really didn't have a way to be able to define, to say specifically what percentage of our beef supply is coming from beef on dairy. Long answer for <laughs> your question. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Chuck Andaris. I'm with the Michael Fields Ag Institute. Um, I, I'm just thinking about like, so 
the way these things, it's like the GDP, for example, grows over time, but there's localized like failures of communities, basically. And so I'm thinking like the the dairy market might be growing over time, but like the dairy communities in Wisconsin are kind of hollowed out because it's all centered in fewer and fewer people. So like, I guess my question is, is, is the continued consolidation of farms and the growth and growth of the amount of cows on a dairy farm, is that inevitable in the current political and economic system that we have? Um, or what kinds of policy tools do we have to change that tra trajectory so that we can have more than like one dairy farm in a township? I guess that's coming to me. Uh, so th thanks, for the, <laughs> thanks for the question and uh, very much like your name. Um, so one of the questions is, is the current structural change sort of inevitable in our current environment? And I would say, Yes, uh, we're going to continue to see the kinds of patterns uh, that we've seen for actually quite a long period of time. I did some uh, analysis of the farm number data, uh, data from uh, back to ten years, and for quite some time we've been losing about losing about one farm dairy farm per day in the state of Wisconsin, and that accelerated a little bit more in, in recent years. Uh, I also want to link this a little bit to the question that Doug asked earlier about uh, kind of structural change in, in dairy and farm size. And one of the things that I like to think about is the proportion of milk that's coming from farms of different sizes, kind of rather than the number of farms, even though that can be very important at both an individual and a community level. And we've actually seen a pretty steady trend uh, in the U.S. and in Wisconsin in terms of the increasing proportion of milk that comes from the largest farms. So. Uh, the exact numbers elude me at the moment, but if you think about farms with more than 1,000 cows, we're probably talking about two-thirds uh, or more of the U.S. milk supply. So most of the milk is being produced on those larger farms. Second part of your question is really what are the policy responses that uh, might help uh, with that process? Uh, I would say that we used to have a dairy price support program whose main purpose was to sort of slow down the rate of structural change and try and make for a little bit more of a soft landing for particularly the smaller farms that were exiting the industry. Since we've moved to a more risk management based type approach to policy, we don't have quite the same support levels and tools in place. It's kind of better on the shorter term, but the longer term makes it maybe a little bit more, more challenging. So one of the things that I think we have as options uh, is uh, I'm also involved with the work of the Grasslands 2.0 initiative, which is sort of trying to envision alternative approaches to the scale and the production technologies used in dairy. Uh, we have some work that we were reporting on fairly soon here, talking about the likelihood of getting folks to do more grazing, particularly for uh, heifer raising. Uh, so providing support for that, and I know there's a bill in front of the legislature to help support additional uh, transitions uh, to grazing. Uh, but I think we have, unless we're willing to sort of spend a, a lot of money or radically alter the nature of our supply chains, we have some challenges that would be uh, challenges to completely changing that trajectory. Although I think there's some things that we can do at the margin that actually might be pretty positive. So thanks for that. And Very that, good. Uh, uh, looking at the clock, we're going to have to pause on uh, the wisdom up here if you want to continue.